right, guys, so in this set of notes, we are going to um, be covering Chapter 6, Voters and Voter Behavior. So we are going to be um, specifically focusing on, in Section 1, the right to vote and how the right to vote has expanded over time um, to uh, various groups of people. And also, um, be, because suffrage has expanded, popular sovereignty has also um, expanded, which is one of the main or basic principles of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so for a second here, though, I just want to take a look back um, on uh, what we covered in our last section of notes. And so we talked about political parties. We talked about the two-party system here in the U.S., minor parties, multiple multi-parties. Um, and we talked a little bit about this spectrum. So we talked about how, um, you know, the far left area was more democratic and then um, in the middle here was more in line with kind of an independent. And then the far right here was kind of more in line with, with the Republican Party. But I want to point out as well that when someone says that they're conservative, um, they're typically going to fall on the Republican side. And when they say they're liberal, they're typically going to fall um on the Democratic side, and being liberal. What? All right. Um, so, uh, in addition, I had to pause the video because Jacob walked in. Um, but if we look on the left hand side here where it says liberal, I just want to also uh, reiterate that the Democratic Party is a little bit more liberal, <laughs> and that, um, you know, that just means that they are okay with change and they welcome it and they. Um, they welcome government intervention, where a conservative is, is slightly different. So they are not going to want as much government regulation. They um, are going to want to go along with tradition, typically. Um, and I also want you to understand that there are variations of um, being a Republican or being a Democrat. So um, you might be reactionary, which is a, a very far right um uh, ideal uh, far right Republican, and then you also could be radical. So you could be, um, you know, uh, a very radical, radical Democrat. And what I also want you to understand as well is that you know, communism, uh, which is um, you know a type of government that we see in foreign countries um, and have seen in our our past as well, and we studied that a little bit in the U.S. Um, that you know, communism would kind of fall over here. So, um, if you are a uh, radical Democrat, then you probably uh, believe in communism and believe that it is uh, the right way to go. Um, and then socialism would probably fall in in this area here. And and then if you look at this picture, um, you can kind of see, um, you know, that fascism is going to be kind of uh, far right uh, and fall into um, you know, the Republican category, uh, per se. And so, you know, the political parties that we decide to be a part of or the beliefs that we hold uh, on certain issues um, really dictate um, our, our voter behavior, as you'll see as we move through this, this chapter of notes. All right, so um, introduction uh, for Section 1, the right to vote. So how have voting rights changed over the course of American history? Over time, voting rights have been expanded to more Americans. Um, this would include women with the 19th Amendment and African Americans uh, as well. Voting qualifications based on property, ownership, religion, race, and sex have all been eliminated through federal laws and constitutional amendments. Um, so with the uh, 15th Amendment, obviously, that gave... Um, African Americans the right to vote as well. The age requirement for voting has also been reduced, and this was with the um, 26th Amendment that reduced the voting age from 21 to 18. Uh, now, why did they do that? Uh, simply because men were old enough to be drafted into the military at age 18, and so they uh, advocated for themselves and said, you know what, if we're old enough to go fight in the war, we're old enough to vote. The electorate. So the electorate is the group of people that can vote. Um, and again, this, uh, the number of people that can vote has expanded over time. The Constitution originally gave the power to decide uh, voter, for, voter qualifications to the states. At first, most states allowed only white male property owners to vote. Um, since 1789, many restrictions on voting rights have been eliminated. And at the same time, the power to decide who has the right to vote has shifted from the states to the federal government. Um, so all this basically says is that you know the power used to be 
uh, within the state government as to who could vote within that state, and now the federal government has made the decision as to who can vote and who cannot vote. Um, I also want to point out that when I'm saying um, restrictions, um, restrictions that kept people from voting, this could be, um, you know, a restriction as simple as if you don't have land, you can't vote, or if you can't pay a poll tax, you can't vote, or if you're African American, you can't vote, or if you're a woman, you can't vote, or if you can't, um, if you don't practice the right religious belief, you can't vote. And so, again, all of these restrictions have been eliminated over time. Um, also, I want to point out that um, our current electorate uh, is around 210 um, million. And again, that's the amount of people that can vote. All right, so stage one. Um, checkpoint. What are what was the first voting qualification to disappear? So this would be religious qualifications for voting were eliminated by 1810. This was followed in the early 1800s by the gradual elimination of property ownership and tax payment qualifications. Um, by 1850, almost all white males could vote in every state. Um, the growth of the American electorate to its present size and shape has come in five uh, fairly distinct stages. Again, stage one being the elimination of some of these qualifications uh, to vote religious qualifications, having to have property, having to be able to pay a tax. Um, and so, you know, by 1850, a lot more people could vote um, already. Stage one. Stage two, after the Civil War, the 15th Amendment made it illegal to deny any citizen the right to vote based on their race of color. So this is the second stage. African Americans were not allowed to vote. However, we all know that um, there were still restrictions for African Americans uh, as far as voting um, because the 15th Amendment was not really enforced. Uh, in theory, this gave um, African Americans the right to vote. However, the spirit of this law was violated for nearly hundreds of years as African Americans were denied the vote in many places. So basically, in, in some places, they had to take a literacy test that was extremely difficult uh, and impossible to pass, and even male people, male men couldn't even pass the test. Um, and also, they had to pay taxes, and um, it was just a very corrupt system that uh, basically the uh, whites would do whatever they could to keep African Americans from actually um, having any voting power. Uh, stage 3, 1920, ratification of the 19th Amendment, which we all know gave women the right to vote. By 1920, more than half the states had already followed the example set by Wyoming in 1869 and given women the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Women's suffrage in 1919. Um, so you can see here in the uh, western part of our nation, um, they were um, able to vote before 1920. Presidential elections only. They were only allowed to vote for presidential elections in this tan color green. Um, primaries and conventions only, and then the orange states uh, did not allow women to vote, again, until the 19th Amendment. Stage 4 and 5. During the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement led to new protections for African American voting rights. This is when we saw the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, defended ra uh, racial equality in voting. And so, again, with the 15th Amendment, it did give African Americans the right to vote, but it it took a very long time for them actually to get the right to vote because uh, there were so many barriers that were keeping them from voting. But with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the history of this act, uh, it basically um, really finally enforced their right to vote and got rid of uh, literacy tests and um, poll taxes that were keeping them from voting. The 24th Amendment, um, in addition, eliminated the poll taxes in federal elections. In 1971, the 26th Amendment gave those 18 and older the right to vote, and we talked a little bit about that already as to why that took place. Voting qualifications. The Constitution sets five restrictions on the ability of the states to set voter qualifications. Anyone allowed to vote for the member of their state legislator must be allowed to vote for members of Congress. And the 15th Amendment bans the states from depriving any person of the right to vote on their race, color, or having once been enslaved. Um, so again, this is just something the state has to follow. Um, and if they don't, then there will be consequences for that. Um, this restriction is of little or real meaning, really, today, um, with only minor exceptions. Each of the states allow the same voters to vote in all elections within the state. So, again, this was an issue early on, and so that they set these guidelines so states would know what they can and can't do. Um, but now states really have it kind of down, and 
it's not so much an issue anymore and they don't need to pay so much attention to these restrictions because they kind of already are following them. Under the 19th Amendment, no state can deprive any person of the right to vote based on sex. No state can levy a tax on the right to vote for president, vice president, or members of Congress. Under the 26th Amendment, no state can deprive any person who is at least 18 years of age the right to vote. Uh, voting qualifications. In addition, no state can violate any other provision in the Constitution when uh, setting its voting qualifications. For example, a state cannot set suffrage qualifications that violate the Equal Protection Powers of the 14th Amendment. Uh, a case decided by the Supreme Court in 1975, Hill versus Stone, illustrates this point. So in Hill v. Stone, the court struck down a section of the Texas Constitution that declared that only those persons who owned taxable property could vote in city bond elections. Uh, the court found this to be an unreasonable classification prohibited by the 14th Equal Protection Clause. And so uh, they ruled that you cannot um, keep people from voting just because they do not own taxable property. I also just want to point out the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. This just gave equal protection for all citizens um, within the United States, um, guaranteeing them um, their rights. <laughs>